And we are back. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Read Z Live. It's our ongoing series of webinars where we bring on professionals from the world of publishing to show you how to write and publish better books. Uh, today, uh, we're not talking about writing, but we are talking about writing in the way that everything is kind of about writing. Uh, we have a guest, Alex Newton from Klytics, who is a, a sort of data guy uh, that we met through our many years sort of working in the indie publishing space. I won't spoil too much, uh, but I'm just going to say I'm glad to see so many of you joining for this. Uh, usually if it's something exciting and creative, uh, everyone turns out in droves. But I think there's a lot you can learn from this, uh, and it's always fascinating. We've had Alex on a couple of times, uh, and I've never failed to learn something. So... While we wait for him to join us, why don't uh, you tell me where you're coming from today uh, and sort of uh, what you guys are sort of looking to do. Uh, are you writing? Are you looking to publish? Is it your first time publishing? Uh, I'll see who is about. Uh, Debbie, so excited. Debbie Pellegrino, good to see you. Uh, Parjanya, uh, hello, hey everybody. David Rothman says hello. Cassie Banks says hi. Uh, ooh, Linda's from The Catskills. Alana from Alberta, Canada. Robert from Santa Maria. Uh, ooh, Susie joining from Hawaii. Fantastic. Uh, ooh, Kathy from Niagara. Uh, Tim from Jacksonville, Florida. Wonderful. So good to see so many of you joining. If this is your first time, my name is Martin. I'm part of the team here at ReadZ. We're a uh, platform, a marketplace where authors uh, can find some of the best publishing talents in the world. We're talking about editors book cover designers, marketers. If you're looking to write a book that gets out there in the world, whether that's through traditional means or by self-publishing, uh, you can find somewhere here at Readsy who can help you. Why don't you click on uh, the links in the description. You can go to our site, sign up for a free account, uh, and see what we're all about. Uh, Duncan from Derbyshire, uh, setting their first book to pre-order, publication 11th of November. Oof, very close now. Kerry Malone, has got a new book, The Eagle's Web, a literary fiction, fantastic. Uh, Patricia's joining from Brooklyn. Uh, uh, Glenn Dilley, uh, Learn Marketing for uh, First Published Book. Wonderful. Uh, and uh, Keith from Florida, AC Books. Oof, doing the old way. One ebook, looking forward uh, to doing more and better ebooks. Wonderful. Glad you could join us. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, our guest today is going to be talking about uh, some of the uh, data behind Amazon. Uh, it's the place where if you're publishing in the English language, uh, you're probably going to be publishing mainly through Amazon, so hopefully you could uh, pick up quite a bit today. Uh, Peter Loy, hi, pig. Zhu uh, Lai Le, uh, the pig has come in Chinese. Uh, Sheila says, why are there no closed captions? Uh, we get asked this a few times. Uh, it's really quite unfortunate. I don't haven't found a solution that does closed captioning for live streams onto YouTube. I do know... Uh, that if you tune back in in a few hours once the replay is up, they tend to automatically caption those and you can follow along that way. Uh, bear in mind uh, that they uh, do not like my accent uh, and I fear to think what they'll make of Alex's. Um, so it tends to be uh, quite garbled. I think it's, uh, it's made for American voices more than anything else. Um, well, I just noticed it's one minute past eight where I am here in the UK, which means it's three on the East Coast, midday on the West Coast, I think like 6 a.m. or 5 a.m. in Australia. Let's get this thing started. My guest today, uh, he comes from the world of indie publishing. He started off as a management consultant before turning his talents uh, to help folks in the self-publishing world. Uh, he is one of the leading voices in uh, data analytics when it comes to self-publishing. Please welcome Alex Newton. Alex, how are you doing? Hey, Martin. Hello, everybody out there. Thanks for having me. And uh, good evening, good morning, or good night for wherever you are on the planet. Uh, but yeah, like uh, really, thank you very much for joining us today. This tends to be quite an international affair. Uh, I think last time we've had people uh, joining us from uh, what's it like Texas. Some of my guests we've had guests coming from Vancouver. Uh, where are we finding you today? Well, I'm dialing in from Switzerland, where I live. I'm a native German, and we moved here some three years ago, so uh, almost from the Alps. Oh, nice. It's uh, yeah, as you say, it's uh, not, not as cold as uh, you'd imagine. No, it's it feels like summer still here in, in Basel in Switzerland, well, uh, so but things are gonna change soon, I feel. Well, even though it's not so cold, it shows some commitment to you're wearing your branded hoodie, you've got to do it for the brand. It, well, uh, camera is too small, but here it is, <laughs> and and uh, yeah, I'd, I at least want to 
don't want to lose my voice here with the yeah, aircon. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I can see some people are still rolling in. Just a bit of housekeeping, everyone. Uh, where it's going to work, we're going to go through this uh, and have a bit of a Q&A at the end. If you want to ask any questions throughout, I'll be sort of keeping an eye on it, but I'll save all the sort of important questions to ask uh, Alex at the end. Um, if anyone asks whether there'll be a replay, yes, you can re-watch the replay uh, Rewatch re the replay at this link, uh, but if you signed up on Eventbrite, I'll be sending out a follow-up email in a few days once I've had the transcript done. So if you prefer reading along, uh, there's that option. Alex uh, is going to be sharing a slide deck. Uh, well, he's going to be presenting one. Uh, if you want to see it again at any time, just rewatch the video and scroll along. Otherwise, uh, he's kindly offered a, a downloadable package of resources, which you can find in the d book description. We'll mention that again at the end. What I'm basically saying is you don't need to take notes now. All this stuff will be available to you. Uh, and yeah, with all that being said, uh, I'll be behind the scenes, Alex, if you need anything. Uh, but otherwise, I'll see you uh, at the Q&A. That's perfect. And I know Martin is going to man the question box and create the questions. And uh, we have a lot of material to go through. <clears throat> Today's topic, Amazon book market secrets. Ooh, you know, yeah, there are secrets. And um, we've been looking into Amazon numbers for seven years now. And uh, we wanted to give you a little bit of lessons learned from all this market monitoring. We're going to look at some longer term trends, shorter term trends, overall observations out of all these years, and obviously also look at some more recent things. Whenever you go into Facebook groups or in these webinars and people talk about Amazon, there is often a lot of, say, hearsay. Hey, did Amazon change its algorithm? Or just very recently, obviously, something did change in the bestseller list display. So Amazon is always changing and authors and publishers are trying to catch up. And since Amazon, frankly, does not publish a lot of things, frankly, they, they have a complete Chinese walls with other departments within Amazon and a complete shutdown towards the external world almost. You don't find them a lot talking about the internal things and obviously not about the algorithms. You get a lot of talk about fact and fiction. Uh, and today we're also going to talk about nonfiction, pun intended. The numbers I'm going to present to you are basically from as, from the screen as you watch the website Amazon. So it's not internal numbers. Um, it is as if you were visiting the store and doing so, say, many, many times over the, over the years. More about that in the second. Now, why is this important? When you work alone as an author or publisher, of course, you have your own insights. If you're already a bit more experienced, you may have published uh, the one or other book. Perhaps you have a whole portfolio of books. You're, you run your marketing campaigns and you sort of sit in front of your notebook and say, OK, book three, promotion 12, this worked. And from this insight, you then progress and you have your own little world where you find out what works for you. And that is the best starting point. You know, you, you are your own consultant. Then many of you uh, join these type of talks, webinars, you are in Facebook groups, and you will have a lot of insights from working with other author friends, with your author friends. And that's great too, because collaboration in many, many cases, it helps. Where it can get a bit touchy is where you have hearsay going on. And just because two people had success with something does not mean that the other 1,000 people in the Facebook group will have success following the, the same strategy. And therefore, what we strive to do is basically look into not the data of just one book or 15 books, but we're working with thousands of books in fact, millions of books over the years, looking at their performance, at their sales ranks, at their prices. Are they in KU, not in KU? Are they series? Are they standalone? What type of genres are they? And from that, you can distill insights. And I hope that I'll be able to convey some of these insights today. Now, if you're not a math genius, don't, don't worry, because um, 
my mission is to bring everything into a very palatable format. So your own qualification that you have to have for today's webinar is if you can read this chart, this exhibit and find out what percentage of the chart looks like Pac-Man, then you are in a very good position to understand the data that I will present today. So if you go on Amazon, a couple of introductory notes, which are very important though, there are many places on the Amazon site where you will find very useful data, especially if you look at them frequently. You have the search, you have the browse categories, you have the bestseller list, and you have the individual product pages. However, there's one very important factor. Obviously, the book market and the Amazon website in specific is, is very, very dynamic. And that is to say that if you browse, say you're researching for your book, you want to find out things about, say, your competition, or you simply look for a trending book, then you will find out that on the very book page, there is, for example, an Amazon bestseller rank, which for many is a very, very important indicator because it shows at least the relative performance of that very one book relative to what? Well, relative to all the other 9 million English speaking titles that you currently find in the Kindle store, as an example, if you're into eBooks. And here comes a very important point. Um, it is sales and borrows that drive the performance of that sales rank. And what can happen if you just look at it at one point in time is that you walk into what I call the real time trap because you can browse the Amazon website yourself. Um, there are certain sometimes Chrome tools. There are other real time tools that may help you with analyzing bestseller lists. But the point is this, say the red dots here that are connected with a red line, they are momentary sales rings of say an hour a day in time. Let's say this is on day number one of, of the observation. This very book is sales ranks 340, 2421. Now, especially if a book is trending very low, it can just a couple of friends purchases that drives up a sales rank significantly. Now, not into the top 2000, but say this book has just done a big promotion. And within a very, very short period of time, in fact, in a matter of days um, or one day, the sales rank is driven up all the way here into the top 2000 of the Amazon Kindle store. And that can happen if you have a big promotion, if you have a book pop and these sort of things. Now, what happens though is as time goes by and here every dot is a day, the the score that you have in the algorithm at Amazon for that very one sales rank is basically halved every day. So very quickly, a book can fall back into oblivion if no continuous marketing happens, especially also here in the low ranks. And this means if you look at just happen to browse your jar on one day and you say, oh my God, this is trending, um, or you are in using real-time tools, that monitor Amazon um, or help you monitor a bestseller list, you can fall into this trap that what you think is trending is actually not trending. So just the data that I'm going to show you today is not from one momentary observation, but it basically takes thousands of observations to then produce a meaningful average number, whether that number is a price point or whether it's a sales rank, um, you name it. And this is basically what we do at Kalytics. So here, another more real, well, the, uh, the, the first one was a real example, but here, you know, you have a book that is oscillating here over a 90 day period. The sales rank goes up, goes down, and you can Im immediately see if you catch looking at a book at a low point, you have the wrong conclusion. And if you have it at, at a high point, you also have a wrong conclusion as to how well it's really doing. And you see that also, as you look uh, at this over time, the average may move up or down. And this starts to give you insights into trends. And I hope I can show you quite a couple of these longer trends that we've been observing over the years. So today, all this is done with a purpose. And the purpose of the data is not to serve itself. It's to serve you and 
to help you with that connection to your readers. Now you're the author on the very left-hand side of this picture where you start from uh, with a good idea, you have a plan, and you have ho hopefully the craft, knowledge, and passion for whatever book and genre you're working at. And there you have the great book and you know then the rest of the journey to ultimately connect with your reader can become pretty tedious and sometimes mechanical, uh, more mundane activity than just uh, having this great pleasure of uh, a creative work when you come up with your work of art. And I will try to show you um, uh, trends specifically within those things, whether it's titles, keywords, categories. I'm not going to go into campaigns today. We're going to look at KU. We're going to look at pricing. We look at reviews. So all these mechanical things here to the right-hand side of the equation, but also, you know, what can you do already at the idea stage and even at the writing stage to um, better make that connection between your idea and book and your reader, even before you pick up the pen. All right, so let's dive into, into um, one of the first of these cogwheels here. First of all, the individual reader. If, if uh, you write, you obviously want to have an emotional impact on the prospective reader, that one individual, but it's hopefully not just one individual that will buy your book, but a whole group of people. And you can talk about this group of people as a part of the book market. They may constitute fans for a specific genre or subgenre. Um, but we're talking in essence about markets and specific submarkets of the book market. And the beauty of any market is there are some very basic laws, you know, whether it's books or spices. I like spices because they have something to do with taste, like books, um, but they have something to do with very simple economics, the supply and demand of spices. Do you have in the street market many, many, many people selling cardamom or cinnamon, or is it just very few? Is there lots of people requesting it or just very few? Um, you get the idea. The basic laws of supply and demand kick in very, very quickly. Now, when it comes to the demand and from the demand, money is earned. And from that earned money, money is being paid out. If you look at the Amazon saturating, this is an analysis we've done a, a while ago. It's a bit like climbing a mountain where on the very left hand side, the tip of the mountain is say sales ranks out of these 9 million of sales rank one to 50,000, we're already at 50,000, you're not selling a lot. And we all know if you're in the very top of the store, if you're on page one, a lot of money is being earned and paid out. So overall, out of this whole thing, um, the calculations we've once done is like at least 87% of all that money is, is made at the tip of the mountain the very tip of the mountain and then, you know, backlist down to 50,000. And then that's where you hardly then sell a copy a day as you, as you go along. So the big question is if, if all the money is up there, who's earning the money. And here I hopefully have some very, very good news for many of you guys who may consider yourself indie authors because it's the indie authors who rock this game. You know, we looked over two and a half years at 630,000 ranked books or ranked book observations across the 30 main top bestseller lists that you find on Kindle. So it's not just romance. It's not just mystery. It's basically a cross section of those 13 main ones which span fiction and nonfiction. And in these, according to our calculations, make up like 39% of the royalty pie, more than the big five, the big publishing companies, more than the Amazon imprints, that is the publishing companies that Amazon bought over time and uh, more than other traditional publishers. So, you know, you can get your, give yourself a big, big pat on the back. It's, it's a great time to be an indie author. It's a great time to be writing. And especially if you're, I'm not saying you should go exclusive with Amazon. That's not the point, but Amazon is just one place where it shows 
how successful indie authors are. And uh, obviously, and hopefully you're uh, using also Read Z and that's why you're here in that journey to success. And sometimes your friend may, friends may, or family may frown at you. Yeah, you're just an indie author. Isn't that just books that are not so good? Well, have a look at this one here. Um, is it just lots of junk books being turned out or, you know, what, what is it? Well, the, the fact of the matter is that when we looked at the quality ratings, the star ratings of 43,000 titles ranked across these bestseller list, and that's over one and a half years. Um, Indie is 4.5 stars out of five. Amazon, even less, 4.4. Okay, big five, 4.6. See, there is no quality issue or quality gap, quite the contrary. And if you turn it around and ask, well, but aren't there many bad reviews? Well, think again. The Percentage of one and two star ratings out of all the ratings that indies have is 4.8. So the lower the value, the better. Um, Amazon imprints have more bad reviews, big five, okay, a little less, but you get the idea. There is no quality gap between you publishing on your own and um, the big publishing companies, at least in the grander scheme of things. And uh, if you then break down that share, by the way, by genre, just to um, to let you know, especially in the very high selling genres, as you will just see, that indie success does span the big genres quite significantly. So in romance, the dark orange area here, 72% of that bestseller list over time, you know, indie. Sci-fi and fantasy, 69%. Teen young adult, 67%. Mystery thriller suspense, you know, the genre heavily contested by the big publishers, 47%. I mean, what more do you want? I think this is just a marvelous story for the many of you who are here listening to this session. And of course, if you, the individual, you may not have had success yet. Some of you say, yeah, I, you know, I have had my bestseller good for you. The point here is to say it is absolutely possible. And it's not just a hope and dream. It is happening as we speak and has happened over the years as the numbers have just shown you. Now, if you enter that game of writing your book, um, you should be aware of, well, where is this market headed and where who are the best mountain climbers there? For example, genre-wise, um, the very top of the mountain is constituted by literature and fiction, uh, then romance, then mystery, thriller, suspense, then sci-fi and fantasy, and then nonfiction, then teen, young, adult. And then you have many, many more and other genres. In our tool, for example, we, we track this down to like a very minute level you know, starting from the big genres, for example, currently this month, romance contemporary would be number one, thrillers number two, women's fiction number three. And this is like the top of 8,000 genres. And you could go down all the list to the very, very bottom where, well, if you are into, say, nonfiction arts and photography, photography travel South America, there the sales rank is only 3.6 million on average across the top 20 titles in the category. So basically zero sales per day. So you have to make your choices wisely. But the point is, if you are going for some of these bigger markets, romance, MTS, sci-fi, fantasy, you cannot go much wrong. But within those, it's competitive. So you also want to drill down and find your specific niche. But the overall climate for these genres is really good these days and has been over the years. Let me just uh, show you some stats here over the last, um, this is now over the last five years, and that little black yellow triangle, well, that is that famous, infamous period that started in March, April 2020, which we all know. Um, since then, romance was a clear winner. Uh, MTS, Mystery Thriller Suspense, has done very well intermittently, uh, currently over the last year, a bit bit weaker. Now, 
This is the average sales rank across the top 100 titles monitored thousands and thousands of books over time. And you see the average across the top 20 for Rome, uh, sorry, top 100 for romance is actually 100. And the average here for mystery thriller spins out of the, the top 20 titles achieve an average out of the 9 million of around 200. So really at the top of the store. Now to plot other genres, you actually have to start squash those two lines together a bit, which opens up space, for example, for how sci-fi and fantasy has been doing. And there we've seen actually a strong rise ever since the start of the pandemic all the way into uh, end of 2021. Now in 2022, we've seen a bit of a, I, I'd call it the post, post-COVID post cool down for sci-fi and fantasy. And by the way, a lot of that peak that you're seeing here in the year 2021 was also driven by lots of sci-fi romance titles uh, where many science fiction romance titles had some viral moments on uh, TikTok driving up the whole curve. Uh, then further squashing the access here a bit uh, gives us the line for a teen young adult. Now, teen young adult <clears throat> also affected a bit by recent bestseller list count cap. I won't get into the details of that, but just in the recent month, there has been, you've always, you can put your book into 10 categories and still can do so. On the very book page, only three categories will be displayed. Um, but you could rank into more than three bestseller lists, and Amazon seemed to have started capping this, which drove a lot of high-ranking romance titles out of the teen young adult bestseller list because there the ranks are already achieved in romance bestseller lists. So a couple of things happen currently, but the overall trend, I think, is what it is. So you have lots of opportunities abound. When it comes to genres, when it comes to tropes, that's a picture I love to show at every webinar because every star in the sky could be an idea for a book, could be an idea for a subgenre, um, could be some tropes, some location, some characters you think about. If you just think a star is a category, you could draw this map. And this is a map which we've been drawing every month for the last seven years which is a market of more than 8,000 Kindle jars. And if you're an author, an indie author, you're also a business person by definition, basically. And you will have to think about supply and demand in various markets. That's exactly what this chart is showing, where every dot is a category. And the higher the dot is on this very slide, the better the average Amazon sales rank that we've already talked about. Talked about. The further you go from the very left to the very right hand side on the image, the more competitive it gets. And you see you have dots on the very left hand side of the graph where you have barely 100 titles in the category. And you have dots that go here way beyond the 100,000 mark. Think about contemporary romance as an umbrella category, which are super high up on the chart, high selling, but also very competitive. Now, if we just looked and filtered out um, out of the table only those categories that say are in mystery thriller suspense. So we would just focus here on mystery thriller suspense. Say that is MTS. Also there you have a ranking of categories where at the top you would have thrillers, then you have suspense and you have psychological si suspense and so on. And if you plotted all those, which we did here, and which we do every month, you get to pictures like this, where, for example, you have like very trending <clears throat> domestic thrillers, basically psychological thrillers that happen in the confines of the neighborhood or home. And um, there, the sales, you see it's sky high. The average across the top 20 is here around sales rank 1,000. And... Um, you have only about a thousand titles in the category. So um, if you are into mystery and, and thrillers, you know, look at domestic thrillers. And if I move here, um, you know, across the data for this, and we just connected and had a look at what is that genre doing on the 
on the very Amazon store. So um, you will see a lot of these books, which um, constitute a very, very thriving market of the current mystery thriller suspense landscape. All right. So have this in mind when you think about your next book project, there are the laws of supply and demand at work. And you want to have specifically watch out for those where you hopefully have high growth, high demand, that is high sales, but as little competition as hopefully possible. Now, for a moment, back to that journey that we talked about at the beginning, and I'm just going to take here a zip of tea. <clears throat> Let's zero in here just as since we've been talking about categories just for a second. So if we zero in in that journey as one example on the topic of keywords and um, keywords and categories. One word about categories, they are important, not just for the strategic purpose of what to write, but also how to market. You want to have your book into the right aisle of the supermarket. I think you have also, by the way, uh, a great blog post by Reedsy uh, from earlier about where to place um, place your books. Now, we try to help there with, with our data, but the point is that you know you have to make conscious choices your book has to be in the right supermarket aisle um tactically it can help with this famous bestseller badge but mind you and that is important there have been changes in recent weeks which is like back to not quite but a bit back to where we were five years ago where your book was just allowed in uh, two to three categories and you had the upload categories in your kindle upload dashboard which confines it to two industry code categories and then you could fiddle around with keywords to force the book into specific categories amazon changed that you can now simply call author central or kindle support and or send them pre-configured emails and tell them look i want to put my book into category xyz in that marketplace and they will do so now up to 10 are still possible but as said um the the back end will basically confine your book to be shown in a, a, in a maximum of three bestseller lists and that is important so you have to uh, find your choices carefully and the main purpose by the way and i don't know whether that's the precursor of a more bigger crackdown into uh category abuse that's also been going on and on, on on amazon where basically you don't want to have a high selling book such as harry potter to be found in like every bestseller list ranging from sci-fi to uh, sci-fi and fantasy fantasy in specific all the way to teen young adults uh parenting family issues orphans which by the way is is has happened because uh put all publishing has put the books uh harry potter is an orphan so you've always found all the books of harry potter leading in the bestseller list there and if a parent was really interested in reading a non-fiction book about orphans the only books they'd find at the top of the bestseller list is Harry Potter, and that's obviously not Amazon's purpose with this bestseller list. And I think now, after a couple of years, they've finally seen that they um, have to do something. Now, uh, one brief word also about keywords. This is not a keyword seminar, but also here we've made our observations over the last um, seven years. Now, first of all, it's important to note <clears throat> That if you look into uh, things like keywords, there are um, tools out there. Um, there are things that, that you can come up with your own. And the important distinction is if you do a search, for example, on Google, then Google registers this. And the, the beauty about uh, the beauty about Google is actually that they uh, they do track not only all those searches which we know they do they harvest all the data but the beauty is also that they publish the data so google especially if you're an advertiser google does publish for real the search volume 
that is happening. So for example, if we talked about how many people are looking into Google for how many people are looking for certain romance genre, then you can either go on Google Trends or you can go into the Google advertising um, backend and it will give you numbers. And the beauty of those numbers is that they are exact. So just as an example, I'm just opening here our um, this month's romance report. And you can look into these keywords over time. For example, good news is the, the search for romance books has been growing over the last five years and fairly significantly. <clears throat> and then it's probably much too small for you to read on the screen, but Amazon will say that currently over the last six months, on average, uh, the second highest searches were for college romance books, then fantasy romance books, then romance fantasy books, then, by the way, mafia romance books, um, dark romance books. And that already gives you an indication that things are getting a bit darker in romance these days. And when it comes to these keywords, i.e. things that people type into Google, there are exact numbers. Now, if you go, by contrast, if you go to Amazon and you start typing romance into the Amazon search bar, you will see that there are suggestions. And that's good because all these suggestions will have a specific minimum volume for Amazon to show them. So if you started trying to look for, say, Amazon slash Z uh, romance, a lot of stuff with that Z that's also being shown. But if, say, Amazon only showed two things, you'd know uh, or nothing at all. You know, there is that's not really being typed in reality. Now, there are tools that help you harvesting these words. They have collections and they also come up with numbers, namely with how many people on Amazon have been looking for, for, for this. But this is where the issue enters in. If you want to have here a, a true gauge of demand because Amazon does not publish these numbers. Now, they do in certain merchandises, certain categories, non-book categories for big advertisers. Yeah. But not necessarily for the uh, for the indie author publisher. And here comes a problem. If you suggest as a final word and keyword, um, we too, you know, look at various tools that you can use at what is being uh, being searched for. So if I go um, currently this month and look at what is the estimated search volume on Amazon for certain terms. Um, there is a myriad of paid and free tools that you can use that will come up with these terms. And also here, the good news is where it is consistent is also here, Mafia Romance is pretty high on top. Other romance th things, you know, they're dovetails. But sometimes um, you also start questioning the validity of these numbers. And that's just a point you have to, you, you have to watch out because whichever tool you use, you have to be aware of, uh, of the fact that, you know, even when Amazon has its limitations, because when they suggest uh, thrillers 2020, well, why not 2021? Uh, or, you know, a specific author, why not another author? Or at the very bottom of this list, thrillers and espionage in the top 10 suggestions. Well, why wouldn't people type in spy thrillers? And that's the point. These are momentary observations and keyword tools harvest those over time. So that good is good. But if you then look at the volume, you know, for example, one keyword tool will say uh, 4,400 for thriller books. The next one will be 1,600 for thriller books. Another one will say 101 searches for this. Another one will say 12,400 for this. You get the idea. Whichever tool you use, you can get bogged down by the numbers and same for our category. You know, don't get just bogged down by the numbers, turn on your common sense and try to understand. For example, I very much use and propose 
the understanding of the syntax of how you really, over the years, see and find um, how searches really work, where people may look for thrillers. They may be more specific and look for legal thrillers. They may consider certain attributes in the search, new legal thrillers, and not just new ones, a secondary attribute may be top new uh, thrillers. They may look for a specific format and a specific thing. We could do a whole seminar just on this, say the, the syntax or the, the architecture of what people will act actually search for, but keep this in mind um, when you go looking for making that connection with a reader via categories and keywords. So think about things such as what is the intent of my buyer? Is it on the very left hand side, very broad where a person may type just presence for man? Or is it narrowing down more specific like books or Kindle books? Or is someone searching for best legal thrillers? Or is it on the very right? Is it about comparisons? People may search for authors like John Grisham. Or they are super specific <clears throat> because they've already made up their mind and say, I want to read John Grisham or even a title, Grisham the Firm. And in making the connection with your readers, I know many of you started using Amazon advertising and fill the advertising platform with a myriad of keywords. You know, before you do, think about this and say, do you really want to compete for a specific ASIN number? Which basically means you may compete with somebody who already made up his or her mind that the person wants to read Grisham, the firm. You'd be going head on with a purchasing decision already being made. So think about this potentially a bit new approach in crafting your keywords to make that connection. All right. Now, over time, volumes for keywords change, categories change, sales change. And over the years, we've looked here at data across many, many genres and um, specifically after Throughout the pandemic, there were changes happening. And um, here are just a couple, which I found very interesting. I reported on some of them before, but here's now the updated data. For example, heat levels on the rise. I find this striking. The blue line is the last seven years of sales rank of the clean and wholesome romance category, a very, very popular uh, niche category on Amazon. And it continues to thrive. At the same time, you know, here at the midpoint and before COVID, we had a very much a low point for erotica literature on Amazon. Well, why that both Facebook and advertising, uh, Amazon advertising heavily restricted ev advertising and still do so for erotica. But there comes a new channel like TikTok, which is much, much less restrictive concerning steamy content when you go at book talk, etc. And all of a sudden you have very steamy, explicit, explicitly labeled erotica books rising back up in the Amazon bestseller lists. Another example is um, escapism versus doom and gloom, especially ever since that little uh, yellow triangle, there has been the rise of epic fantasy in anything epic, anything fantasy and potentially a bit more uplifting while dystopian post-apocalyptic clearly taking a dive. And this is an important one and um, one which could be for a long discussion as well. The red line is the average sales rank of fiction. The blue line is the average sales rank of nonfiction. And you see all throughout even the, the high time of Kindle gold rush, the red line has traditionally outsold the blue line, the, the many self-help type of titles, the biographies, you, you name it. There came the pandemic, yellow black triangle. And um, I don't know, that's when people stopped uh, looking at leadership books and motivational books. And um, perhaps they just wanted to dive into a nice novel. It's um, 
I'm not sure what's entirely at work there. Perhaps also uh, some nonfiction authors publishing exiting the market because I don't know who wants to read the 200,000 um, laws of attraction book that is only copied from another laws of attraction book. You get the idea. And that is not dismissive of nonfiction authors. In fact, there is great, great content. And many of my friends are nonfiction authors. But there is something going on you have to bear in mind if you are into nonfiction. All right. Um, last not least, you also want to hopefully catch the wave as a writer. When you think about the specific topics um, you write in. So here it is important when you try to make that connection. The good news, by the way, that these waves are usually pretty long term. Um, this is an example I tend to show to illustrate this, where I say, thank God the book market is not the fashion industry, because you see here, um, this is a picture of 15 years where the line denotes the Google trends, the Google search interest for specific terms. And uh, there's vampire romance in blue. Years later, paranormal romance, the next uh, wave. And if you look over the last two to three years, you have things like fantasy romance and dark romance really, really going big. And some evergreen things, by the way, ever since Fifty Shades of Grey, billionaire romance still doing great. Um, five, six, seven years into into the whole jo journey of this genre. All right, so talking of uh, journeys, uh, we know it's a big commitment if you are a writer. And uh, the, the whole point of the presentation up to this point was know, thy, know your market because you may want to gauge things like trend, is it trending? Is it big enough? Is it competitive? Is it overcrowded? Is it undercrowded? Is my book project viable? You may want to check on this before you even pick up the pen. The journey can become much, much less painful. Back to these cogwheels and the journey from connecting with your readers. Now, after that great book is written, you also think about other things like book titles, book covers. And also here, I want to point out that um, my, my accounting teacher always said there is no accounting for taste. Now, many later years later, I ask, well, is there or isn't there? Data in action, cover design. Also here, you know, don't ask your husband or wife for which book cover he or she likes the most because the fact of the matter is every book market, every target market, as you know, comes with certain cover cliches. You want to specifically meet those cliches because they are what sells. And whether it's domestic thrillers or whether it is paranormal women's fiction here in the image or contemporary Western all, or this very new and dark mafia romance, very distinct covers. And if you say, Alex, but that doesn't matter, well, think again, because if you go, for example, if I look into our uh, romantic comedy report that we publish every year, we look at the market shares of specific cover designs. And here, if you look at our virtual bestseller list of rom-com top 500 that we created, flat vector graphic is 41% of the market. A sexy guy is 31% of the market. So in total, we are, have almost three quarters of the market completely crushed by those two cover designs. And then comes all the rest with a, a, a girl, a romantic couple, a sexy couple, and Mr. Handsome. So your partner in life may say, oh, I really like this, 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 this girl on the cover. Well, it may work for very specific things like whatever curvy girl romance, but romantic comedy in general, it's just a cover that does not work as well as all the other cover designs. And that's something we've observed, not just in one year, but over a five year period. Then, in back to this journey and let's zero in at one other topic you see here 
I'm going now further left of that journey, even before the book, the great book is written, where you plan, where you have your ideas and where you have the craft knowledge and passionate work. And, and here you can even go into things like, um, well, what are trending characters in, in my specific genre? Let's say you wanted to, let's use the term, right to market in paranormal romance. So if I look at the data that we publish in our paranormal romance report, if we look at the specific tropes and characters across 10,000 top selling titles over the years, then you see the number one character is the shapeshifter. Number two is a mate. Number three is a, were a werewolf, then an alpha, then a vampire. Um, we had lots of academy romance. So you have the students and apprentices where you have a, also an overlap with urban fantasy romance. And you, you can go down the list. Dragons have been doing fairly well, but you know, at the very bottom of the list, you have the more urban fantasy type gods, half gods or bear shifters commercially interesting, but commercially by far not as high selling as the say more cliche mainstream type of characters that have made the genre as big as it, as it is these days. And I could go on and on and on. Um, we could talk about series. Shall I write a series or shall I write a standalone book? Here we have to face up to the market reality that in almost any genre these days, the you have a predominant, a, a real dominance of series. So back in 2016, we saw about a third of the book, just more than a third of the books being series across the top 30 main categories. By now, in 2022, it's 45%. And that's a significant increase. And if you, if you go into specific genres, the the penetration of series can be even more drastic. For example, in sci-fi and fantasy, 83% of the top selling books are part of a series. By the way, if you went into like mystery thriller, suspense in general is like 59% as per this graph, but also there it can vary in sub genres where if you go into cozy mystery, you know, you have long series, you know, the Donna Leons of the world with 20 books or more, and they completely dominate the market or take the, you know, big authors in, in uh, paranormal cozy mysteries, you know, take the Annabelle Chase, the Amanda Lees, you know, their series are long and uh, the backlists are humongous. You know, the output is just amazing. And this is something you have to know before you uh, or when you write in a specific genre. And by the way, even Harry Potter, you know, that's all what we want to write. If we look at the sales rings over the last five years of the Harry Potters, the beauty from a business point of view of a series are this, for example, here we looked at the individual sales ranks for, um, for the Harry Potter books the last five years. And you see the specific time here where um, the big promotion was going on again for Harry Potter, Dark Orange, book number one, and you see when that has a peak, just hours later or a day later, the second one has a peak, then the third, the fourth, the fifth, the, and so on and so forth. So you get the idea. So the marketing of the one title immediately has also a return on investment on the later title. Seems common sense, but here you really see the facts of the matter. And this is why um, uh, series have become also from an economic point of view so important. Um, Last topic, perhaps very specialized, but there is always the question that comes up in the Q&A. So I already talk about it. KU or not KU? That is the question. As uh, Laurence Olivier here, 1948, uh, would, would have said, well, not quite, uh, but here the point is KU, Kindle Unlimited, so going exclusive with KDP Select, which makes as an author for a 90 day period, which makes your book exclusive for Amazon and part of their Kindle Unlimited borrowing scheme. Um, it also, the fact of the matter is that channel has gained share. Back in 2016, we had about 44% of the books across the top 100s, across main categories in Kindle Unlimited. Now it's 50% and it's 
gone down gone, it has gone down again from uh from year 2019 so we see a bit of an equilibrium a balance of the one and the other however it can differ widely by individual jars so if i go back to our monthly category uh monthly category tracking um whichever jar you choose the point is if you look at the competitive intensity of a specific genre and for example here in mystery thriller suspense if i sorted this in descending order of what the share of um, book supply is in kindle unlimited versus non kindle unlimited interesting for example number one would be vigilante justice so the mark dawson type of genre the lee child type of genre in there by now 70 72% of the book supply is in Kindle Unlimited versus if I walk the list all all the way down what we monitored here is by contrast the category um historical mystery let's take this one there it's only 29% so again you have to look at your specific subgenre in question to make a choice as to whether you should go into Kindle Unlimited or not, or at least know where the market uh, for that specific subgenre is heading. And of course, if you are in in romance, you you will have figured out that uh, you know here is this summer. If you go into the romance bestseller <clears throat> bestseller list at a point in time, and you take out all the non Kindle Unlimited book books, you're left with this list. Almost the whole bestseller list is Kindle Unlimited. At that point in time, it was 77% of the titles were Kindle Unlimited. If you did that for all the genres in romance, for example, over time, 81 on average. So even higher was the share of Kindle Unlimited titles. Does this mean you have to be in Kindle Unlimited? Well, yes and no depends on the genre uh, again said but you also have to distinguish that the bestseller list they express the number of borrows and the number of sales being made and since kindle unlimited from a buyer point of view are essentially free after you paid your subscription these books tend to convert very well and since they drive the sales rank in the same way as sales you tend to see a lot of ku books in the bestsellers. However, you have also a, a display algorithm that is not based on just sales, namely the so-called popularity lists or the search display results here on the left-hand side of this chart. And here, um, I, without going into all the details, but here the good news is when you search for something, um, the browse categories on the left-hand side of the exhibit all of a sudden, all of the books you see, for example, let's do a real life example. If you go on Amazon and type in, um, well, let's just, let's just do it. If you type romance into the search bar, you will see result number one right here by now with one click. Yeah, it's not in Kindle Unlimited. Next one, buy one, buy with one click, buy with one click. Why would Amazon do that? Buy with one click, buy with one click, buy. Now comes a Kindle Unlimited title. Now, why would Amazon do that? Well, the subscription, the subscribers have already paid, but where can they make new money by people who are not part of Kindle Unlimited and who may be prepared to buy a book at a full price? And the result of that is that if you uh, do the numbers, that the book overlap between the bestseller list and what you're shown by searching for romance is only uh, 36%. And in fact, 37% of the books are not in KU if you type the search for romance. So there's also good news for those of you who decided not to go with Amazon exclusive. And that's another lesson learned here of the last seven years of um, number crunching last point before we go to the q a martin um as mentioned before indie authors you must not be shy 
of the quality of the books that you're writing. So we had this exhibit before where indies achieve the same, if not better ratings than traditionally published authors. And that's not being dismissive of traditionally published authors. In fact, many of you may be hybrid doing both. And even if you're just traditionally published, that's a perfect, that's a perfect channel. And congratulations if you have your contract. It's just to say for all of you who are indies, you just have to be not to be shy of the quality you achieve. And that's also means don't be shy of selling your book at the appropriate price meaning don't undersell. And if I look at the lesson learned from the last seven years of looking at the, at the, at the data here every month. So if we took out of the data uh, this month and then plotted it for romance and just took it for this month and then the previous month and do so for the last, for the last seven years, we'd get a picture that looks like this where we have here the price of love, the price of a romance novel, the average price across the top 100 titles in the romance category. Yes, there were the days back in 2017 where an individual romance title would go for as low as 249 uh, in dollar terms, which, you know, yeah, <laughs> it, it was what it was. It was a super competitive time, but look at what have happened ever since. So if your mind is still stuck in the time where you felt, oh my God, all these 99 cents books being out there, that's what pulled down the price significantly. That is no longer the case. Why do I think it's no longer the case? Because it's just no longer affordable for authors. Because today, for your book to be shown, you have many of you have to do advertising. And from a cost point of view, if you sell your book at 99 cents and you make just 35% of this, as opposed to making potentially 70% on a 499 book, the economics also of your advertising are much, much different. So um, don't be shy of the quality you achieve. I'm not saying you now have to up the price by X number of dollars. Obviously, consumers are sensitive to price and in current economic uh, conditions anyway, but you get the idea. So with this, you know, don't be shy to uh, use some numbers in your, in your decisions. If you want to do right to market, you don't have to bend yourself. You don't have to do this. You just have to know the market. That is my big suggestion. Um, the sky, although we've seen a bit of a slowdown this month uh, for the first time with a Kindle Unlimited fund being stagnant from one one to the other, uh, skies are still clear. If we look at the projected growth for this year of the um, Kindle Unlimited fund as one indicator of the overall ebook market, now that um, seven months are already in the in the pocket, in Amazon's pocket or in the author's pockets. We we're gonna see another in total about five hundred twenty six, say plus minus a couple of million million dollars will be paid out in twenty twenty two to indie authors and publishers, and um, that's another seventeen percent growth year on year, which I think in the current climate, even if it's slowing down is a tremendous piece of news. So I hope this gave you a little bit of food for thought, numbers for thought. I believe where the numbers and the arts meet, lots of magical things uh, can happen. And I hope that with this, you can get on whatever the topic which book to write, what cover to choose, what should be the words in my title, what should be the keywords, what should be the categories to choose. Um, from the very strategic questions all the way to the very nitty gritty, you can benefit of looking at data. And uh, of course, if you have more appetite on this, we provide market research done for you. I've showed you a little bit from our monthly category performance database. If you're not into spreadsheet, we have ready-made genre reports for you that you can buy individually. Or if you're interested in more, I recommend a membership. And if you just want to get the feet wet and have a bit of a look into what we do, um, you can have a look into a link that also Martin is going to put down 
uh, in the in the links of the video at klytics.com. That's k-lytics.com slash readsy, which will take you to, I think, currently the Christmas John reports. They're still the last edition, but if you sign up there, you will have the new edition, which will come out uh, this month as well, and as well as the up-to-date category performance report for just the umbrella 30 main umbrella categories. So the sky is the limit here, the night sky. It's already night sky in, in Switzerland. Many stars to travel to with this, a, a big thank you. And um, Martin, I'd say with this, I'd be happy to take any questions that uh, you may have. Thank you very much for listening up so far. Yeah, amazing. Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, yeah, we're going to stick around for a few minutes to do some Q&As. Uh, we have some very specific questions about certain genres, uh, but before we ask anything, I'm going to hold this to ransom, see if we can get us up to 200 likes on this. If you've enjoyed the presentation so far, please do give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to our channel. Uh, uh, yeah, it really does help us out. Uh, I've got a few sort of questions, uh, let's see, uh, sort of popping from a while back. Someone asked the question, I'm not sure, uh, is there such a thing as a gift list rank? Um, yes, well, there is the paid, I, I'm not sure about gift sales rank, but what, what there is for sure is any book, um, depending on whether it's, if it's a paid book, it will be in the bestseller rank for paid books, right? So if you are on the Amazon website, um, they changed the interface a little bit. Let me make it bigger, but there is bestseller lists and more, right? And once you click on that, it takes you on to all sorts of bestsellers. In this case, let's go for the Kindle one, which is right here in the middle. And it takes you then, by the way, there are different ebook stores. So um, you want to look in this case here for Kindle ebooks. And if you then take like, you see already here, there is a paid bestseller list where there is a specific rank. And then there is the top 100 free bestseller list. So if you consider free a gift, yes, there is a bestseller rank, in fact, for all of these categories. Um, so right now, number one store wide for free books, convenient marriages, wrong wedding. So once you click on that, you know, go to the very down of the page to the product details, it will show, well, you know, pretty nice cover here. And uh, this will show you number one free in the Kindle store and I hope that answers the question, but that would be the free part of the store, which is a gift in essence. Uh, cool. Uh, let me see if I could pick another question. Uh, someone, I think, asked something about uh, children's books, in particular pictures books. Uh, yeah, in general, like uh, how does sort of books for younger readers, like picture books, perform on Kindle? Um, it is a mixed picture. First of all, it is, um, you have to distinguish between teen, young, adult and middle, say middle grade. There is no specific category for middle grade, but if you go into children's books, you can click on an age bracket, 12 to 14, um, there where the parents, you know, have no problem with a kid being on screen. Um, ebook does play a role. However, by and large children's books, there was a big kids book hype but if i uh, just look at the sales performance you know if i um of children's books in in general let me just clear the filter and we can have a look um together so if we search for anything to do with children in our uh this month's database which i'm doing right now here now see the umbrella category here literature and fiction Children's children ebooks, literature and fiction, the average sales rank across the top 20 title in the Kindle store is around 1,176. So, you know, say whatever it is between 80 to 100 copies a day. Um, yes, you know, there can sales to be made, but, you know, let's look at it. There are 279,000 titles in the category growing every month. Yes, it does exist, but it's a bit of what we call a beaten track mainstream market and if you then look into the specific books 
that you find there, you will tend to see that sometimes uh, Harry Potter most often is up there. You have the Wimpy Kid and a couple of very famous children's books. So these are what drive the sales. And then you very quickly have a long tail of not so high selling kids books. So I'd say it's a mixed picture. Like for me, I always, I always thought that because a lot of, especially when people, I think, in our sort of communities talk about children's books, it tends to be things like picture books for like under fives, where I imagine like, are, digi- are e-books like a big thing amongst those categories for the picture books? Is there a, dis- a distinct uh, uh, category for that? Well, there is a distinct category for those because if you go into like picture books um, and then like pets, animals, there are all ebook categories for those. In fact, there is a myriad of of highly granular ebook categories. So yes, they do exist, but I, I think what what has to be said also now this does not list children's books here on this graph, but what you ha- have here is. There is the Amazon store-wide bestseller rank, not just Kindle, but it's basically a book bestseller rank, which is a cross-format bestseller rank. And with that, what we looked at here over the years is the share of specific formats that drive the performance. So in romance at the very top, you know, it's really the Kindle eBooks driving the performance of that cross-format bestseller list. Now, children is not listed here, but um teen young adult is at 40 percent and if i remember collect correctly say in the high times children's were in the big hype times yes there is 20 percent of the market which is ebooks i think right now it's more down to 12 15 percent and um for example also very interesting if you're into into non-fiction you know there were times where self-help was like really really big but you know, self-help, the top ranks are driven by the books that you also find in the airport bookstores and not ne- and audio in specific, not necessarily ebooks so much as we had them like um, five years ago where everybody was publishing his or her law of tra- attraction book or other type of self-help title. Uh, cool. I've got a question here. Um, do you know much about Amazon categories? I didn't catch that. Could you repeat that? Amazon categories. Some folks have been asking about there's been a recent change, I believe, to the um, number of yes. categories you can be listed for. Um, what do you know about that? Like uh, it used to be, I think you could pick like four or six or something. And uh, now it's like capped to three. Well, here the story is evolving and, and perhaps I can pull up a file that will try to illustrate um, that a bit. But the long and short of it is the thing is still a bit in flux. It did impact actually quite significantly some of the uh, bestseller, also average bestseller ranks of certain of certain categories. And uh, while I talk, I may, I may even have an example um, at hand. But while we do so, so yes, always remember where we've been coming from. So back five years back, you had only two categories, those you could upload in the Kindle dashboard, then you could tweak them with keywords to be shown in more categories, but you were always confined to 10. Right now, I'm hearing the signal. We saw it with our authors. Um, You can still put your book into more than three categories, but if you go onto an individual book page, it has always been the case over the last two years. So there's no, sorry, even more years, there, um, let me let me show you. Um, if we take this example here, uh, or let's specifically take the Harry Potter one we just see, because that's a great example. Now, Pottermore Publishing and J.K. Rowling, they have a special VIP treatment at Amazon. So they are not even just in 10 categories. If you go into the Amazon backend and check c- categories via the API, Harry Potter part one is in 17 categories, right? And since it is ranking so high, say currently store wide, if I go down, it is ranking 109 store wide. So if it's in, in, in 17 categories and it's store wide 110, it should show up in at least a dozen of categories 
in the in the top 100, if not at the very top. But as you rightly say, on the very book page, it has always been the case down here that ever since like three years ago or so, there used to be a, a long list of categories, right? Uh, which I think we once showed in a in a in a in a, in a blog post, which is dated but shows you that that history base BISAC codes, um, codes Catalytics. If I Google that, I think there was a. Uh, I accept everything here. BISAC codes and KDP categories. So here we once saw that before all this happened, there was a time when you had all sorts of categories going on. So here, look down here. Now, and today's they've cut it down, but back in the days, you had like literally all these other categories where your book was in listed. Then they confined it to three. Then they cut down the category path information. And now if I go to a Harry Potter book, it's still just three categories, but here comes the catch. Even if it's still in 17 category, because Pottermore has the VIP treatment, they will show it only at one point in time in a maximum of three bestseller lists. And here is the other important point. It's not Kindle specific, but it is store specific. So if I click on this one, I'm pretty sure this will take me exact well it is an ebook category but you know three days ago harry potter was in in uh, paperback listed because there it achieved the best a best bestseller rank and it was in two kindle categories in here it would be in fantasy in that bestseller list and in the adventure one so here it is number one but what used to be the case is that you could go to the say teen young adult orphans family social issues category and find Harry Potter in there. But now they removed that from that very bestseller list at a point in time. And that led to the fact that the average sales rank for many categories had taken a dive because many high selling books have been removed from that display. Uh, okay, I'm uh, gonna just to repeat it. Joe asks, uh, "How do you go about getting access to the data you are sharing?" <clears throat> Thank you for asking. Well, the, uh, the the data we showed can be found on our website, which is kalytics.com, and you also get there via the link that um, Ritzi has kindly shared. Um, from there, from the home homepage, you can further go to the pricing page. We do share also individual reports, which you can buy in the shop. But if you wanted to have access to the whole list of the 8,000 categories that I've shown you in that spreadsheet, it's very simple. It's a downloadable spreadsheet that is uh, basically updated every um every month so if you wanted to have for example this is the october data and you can go all the way down there it has uh, at any point in time the sales volume the volume growth the price the competitive intensity and you can also simply say click on a link either the bestseller link or the browse category to get to the amazon store and check what's really been displayed in the categories you can get that via kalytics.com and uh, the very detailed one would be the elite membership, which gives you access to all those 1,000, uh, sorry, 8,000 plus categories. You can also go monthly. And uh, if you only want to have a la carte, you can go to the kalytics.com slash shop, where you could simply just get one report for a specific genre. Um, but if you're interested in that very data bias, you would need an elite membership, which you could then retrieve all the content. Now I'm not logged in, but you could then retrieve all the content in the members area. And uh, so kalytics.com. And uh, of course, we'd invite you 
to use it to find the best book market opportunities in a second. So thanks a lot, Martin, for that question, of course. Um, we also do this for a living, so happy to share the link. <laughs> Uh, speaking of doing this for a living, uh, I might as well plug Reedsy. Uh, lots of chat about looking for book marketers and editors and proofreaders. Uh, that is basically what Reedsy does. We're uh, an, a platform <coughs> where the most experienced, best proofreaders, editors, copy editors, marketers, book cover designers, all based here on Reedsy. You can find those people elsewhere. Uh, but you can't be sort of assured that they have experience uh, within the publishing industry. So if you're wanting to give your book uh, the best chance of success, um, sign up for Readsy. You can browse through all the professionals we have here uh, and send a request. There's no no strings attached uh, when you sort of send a request, so give it a go. Um, all right, I'm going to call it to an end. We've been going for oof, 80 minutes now. Wow, <laughs> it but, took longer than we expected, hey. but I hope you found it interesting. Yeah, like it's been fantastic. I have a look through the uh, comments later. It's been very, very useful. Uh, okay, so uh, everyone at home, uh, we're going to do another uh, Read Z Live in two weeks. It's going to be on writing picture books. So if you're one of the folks asking about kids' books and picture books today, do tune in for that one. It's, uh, it's going to be a good one. Uh, Alex, before we sign off, is there anything, uh, last message you want to share with the folks at home? Big thank you for watching. Big thank you for engaging. Big thank you for being an author. I think the world needs more artists. I'm very convinced of that. And, um, you know, with folks like Reedsy, you can really get your message out there. And I think many people need good messages these days. So thanks a lot for joining tonight. And uh, I look forward to being back here at some point in time. Amazing. Can't wait. All right, everyone. Take care at home. See you next time. Bye.